Uh, my name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm excited to, uh, to walk through God's Word with you this morning. We're going to be in John chapter uh, 16, the very end of 16, uh, from verses 16 to uh, the end of the chapter. And as we do, we're coming to the end of what, um, what commentators call the farewell discourses. Somewhere between the upper room where Jesus had his Passover meal with his disciples and the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will be praying and travailing before he comes to the cross, somewhere between those two locations is where we find ourselves in the final week of Jesus' life. Somewhere between uh, Jesus looking at his betrayer and saying, what you do, do quickly, and the actual betrayal. That's where we are. And so you can imagine, as we've observed for the last couple of weeks, that the stress level, the anxiety level, the sorrow level, the confusion level is all high, right? It's all, it's all elevated. All of the tension going on in everyone's souls, including Jesus himself, it's all elevated. And into this moment, Jesus uh, comes to tell his disciples some things. Now, last week, we, we explored this idea that, that Jesus wants us to be united with him through the power and the ministry and the presence of God the Holy Spirit. And that's a massive, massive idea. It's a massive point. In fact, Jesus turns the bad news to them of his departure into good news when he says, I'm going, but it's good for you that I'm going because as I go, I'm going to be sending God the Holy Spirit, not just to be beside you, but to be God within you, God among you. And that's really good news. And it's important that we know that when we hear the context of what is going on today, because Jesus is getting really, really clear that it's about to get really, very bad. Really, really, very bad. So let's read, and then let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us this morning, not just observe what is written here, but to experience God in the text. John 16 Verse 16, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while, and you will see me, and then a little while, you will not see me, and because I go to the Father. They were confused. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will see me and again a little while and you will not see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is giving birth, she is sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask whatever, I'm sorry, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name, but ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say that you will ask the Father, that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world and now am leaving the world and going to the Father. So his disciples said, Ah! Now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you you know all things and that we don't need um, anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Father, I'm asking your help today. Jesus said that we can talk to you, Father. Just there. What a wonderful privilege. Lord, for the first time in the landscape of redemptive history, your people could talk to you. Thank you for the intimacy with God that we experience as your people. 
We want to glide by that this morning. Father, would you do as you promised to do through your son Jesus and send the Holy Spirit. Empower me, anoint me to preach your word faithfully and powerfully. And I pray that you would um, enable us, your people, to hear it and be changed by it. Lord, just as the disciples here had much sorrow at the impending departure of their friend and their Lord Jesus, there are my friends here this morning who have sorrow for all kinds of reasons. And I pray just as to them their sorrow was transformed into joy, you would help us this morning have our sorrow transformed into joy. For the glory of your Son, amen. There is a, um, an interesting fixation that we Westerners, particularly we Americans have, with the avoidance of pain. Now, part of it we can understand because no one, no one enjoys pain, right? Like, that, that's, not, that's not typically something that we, you know, go out seeking, like, what are you going to go do tonight? I'm hoping to get in a fight, and then someone breaks my arms. Like, no one's out, if, if that is, you didn't laugh at that, did you? You don't do that, right? Okay, don't do that. That's a really bad idea. Maybe your mom didn't tell you. Don't do that. Um, we, we, don't, we don't do that, and, and particularly in American culture, we try as hard as we can to avoid pain altogether. Now, this is important to note because when we come to God, we come to him assuming that he has exactly the same perspective on sorrow and pain and anxiety and negative things that we do, that they're bad, evil, wrong, and that we never, ever, ever want to experience them, and that if we come to him, he is going to blow up the bumpers that go in the bowling alley of our life, and we'll just softly bounce from side to side, never hitting a ditch, and ultimately knocking down the pins. Do you know what I'm saying? That is a lie. God is not like that. And God does not promise that. And knowing that is extremely important because that's really what the disciples were discovering here. And as they discovered it, you can imagine that their anxiety level was increasing. As we mentioned last week, the more and more Jesus talks, the more and more they realize that all of their dreams for like Jesus being the king who would like pull out the actual sword and slay actual Romans and establish like an actual, you know, physical kingdom right now, that's not the way this was going to roll. Jesus was doing something else. Jesus was talking about being a king but then dying. Jesus was talking about winning a victory through going into the ground. We did, everything was about to get really, really strange. And now it's really coming into focus that all of their hopes and dreams are Exactly the opposite, really, of what Jesus has in store. And so Jesus is about to lead them from the front to a rather sorrowful moment, isn't he? Jesus is about to lead them from the front through a rather sorrowful, I mean rather sorrowful, that's, that's a bit light, isn't it? I mean through the worst, the darkest, the most broken, the most difficult, the most challenging moment in the history of the planet since our fall, which would be the crucifixion of our Creator. This is important to understand. Because what I want to do this morning is, is look at this story on two levels. I want to help you understand what's going on in the, in the text. And then above that, I want to apply, okay, if this is going on for them, what does that mean for us when we walk through sorrow? And so we're going to be kind of doing those in tandem. What, what's going on in the text, and then how do we journey through sorrow and into joy in the same way? Because here's fundamentally what, what I'm what I'm convinced of. Jesus knows our sorrows better than we think. He knows our sorrows better than we think. And he offers victory better than we dream. He knows our sorrows better than we think. And he offers victory better than we dream. This is extremely important. Because when you go through sorrow, when you go through hardship, the very first temptation, often, is for you to think, God has no idea what this is like. I mean, right? I mean, this is sort of the middle schooler reaction in all of our souls. Like, you don't know me, right? You don't know what I'm walking through. Which, if you ever feel yourself telling that to God, stop. Don't say that. <laughs> because Jesus knows our sorrows much better than we think, and he also offers us victory much better than we've dreamed. So let's, let's journey through this moment with the disciples and see if we can make some application to us. Again, a little while, in verse 16, he says, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while and you will see me. Talk about uncertainty, right? Like, if, no matter what leadership books you read, they all say basically this, don't make your people feel uncertain, right? 
Like, don't, don't make your people feel uncertain. Like, what, the, the first thing you're never supposed to do when you're leading an organization, whether you're like a volunteer leader, leading a team, if you're leading a small group, if you're leading a church, if you're leading a business, what you never want to do is walk to your shareholders meeting and be like, yeah, it's going to be good and it's also going to be pretty awful. Like, oh, and then you see your stock go, right? That, you're not supposed to do that. And it's the very first thing Jesus does, which means if we're going to see that Jesus knows our sorrows but also leads us in victory, there's, it starts in a moment of uncertainty. And very often, that moment of uncertainty is God-designed. Like, this is a God-designed moment. It's not like Jesus is surprised, like, oh, I'm going to have to die. No, it's very God-designed. And, and so he says, look, in, in just a, a bit, a small amount of time, you're not going to see me any longer. But don't worry, a little bit of time after that, you will. Does that help you? <laughs> it doesn't help me at all. I want to know, like, okay, what time, what day? I want to put it in iCal. I want to know who else is going to be there. I want my phone to tell me. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is just enough information to stress me out and not enough information to help me out. You know what I'm saying? It's uncertainty. Now, we must understand, okay, if Jesus is really leading these guys, he knows exactly what he's doing. Because he very well could have been like, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to walk from here to here, and then I'm going to get arrested here, and we're going to get crucified here. But don't worry, three days later, I'm going to rise here, and appear here, here, and here, and then you're going to go here, right? And he didn't. He didn't do that. He just said kind of vaguely, guys, this is about to be a very uncertain moment for you, but I want you to have hope. Because even though it seems like I'm not going to be there, you'll see me again. Now, okay, so at the first level, Jesus is talking about his impending arrest crucifixion, death, and burial, right? You know, we're somewhere in the final week, and Jesus is saying, in just a little while, they're going to murder me, and I'm going to die, and you won't see me. Now, hindsight is very helpful here, but they didn't have any of that. So imagine how stressful that would have been. They had no idea. They're like, what? Oh, oh, okay, you know, I mean, you're kind of trying to, like, give your teacher the benefit of the doubt, but you're like, Peter, what's he talking about? I don't know. Right? They didn't know, so there was some uncertainty. That's what's going on. The first part of this journey from sorrow to joy, it starts with some uncertainty. And, and now at the second level in our lives, that's very often the case too, isn't it? It's very often the case too. Uh, one of the things, you know, we're in, in the beginning stages of life and doctrine right now, and one of the things that we always work through at the beginning is, listen, you don't approach God by saying, okay, I'll believe you as soon as I understand you. Because that's like saying, I'm going to, you know, agree that I live on planet Earth as soon as I wrap my arms around it. Like, you can't. Understanding comprehension means literally to like put your arms around something. And so we're not going to ever come to the place where, oh, I'll trust you and I'll follow you, Jesus, through this journey of sorrow to joy as long as I understand what you're doing. <laughs> That's not, I mean, this is not a recipe, okay? Jesus is not Jamie Oliver pulling out your little, no, you don't like him, Gordon Ramsay? No? Anybody else? Jesus cusses a lot less than Gordon Ramsay. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. Sorry, I like the Food Network. Okay. So, he's not pulling out a recipe for your joy. It starts with some uncertainty, and you ought to know that. Jesus has designed a moment for his disciples, layer one, of uncertainty so that they trust him and have hope in his appearing. Layer two, Jesus has designed moments of uncertainty for you and me, where we will not understand how it will all work out. But he says, but take heart, I'm coming. This is very important for us to understand. And so, as you can imagine, his disciples were extremely helped by this, and the conversation was over. No. His disciples were going, mm hmm. But then they were asking among themselves, what is going on? And so they, I mean, we even have the quote from John. They literally were quoting him, trying to figure out the meaning of his words. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. It says in verse 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him something. And so he said, is, is this what you're asking? Jesus knows our sorrows better than we think. Because not, he doesn't just stick us in a moment of uncertainty. But he has with us and alongside us a God-sized empathy. God, he has God-sized empathy. He knows when you don't know. <laughs> like Jesus knew, and, and John makes this like editorial remark. I mean, he kind of pauses the story, and goes out of his way to say, listen, Jesus knew that his boys were kind of freaking out about this a little bit. But don't worry, Jesus is saying. Is this what you're saying, he's asking. 
He knows when uncertainty stresses you and causes anxiety in your soul, and he will come alongside you. This is very important. It's very important because this is not, as I've said a few times, in the, if we walk through the Gospel of John and you walk through this merely thinking that Christianity is just like a philosophy, a worldview, a religion, it's all those things, but it's much more than just those things. It, it's a relationship with God. That word is so used that it's tattered to pieces now. It's hard for it to have any meaning, but let's just try and reinvigorate it with some. If you're in relationship with someone and you walk in and you're stressed, they know that because they know you, right? Like, I don't need my wife to hold up an emoji telling me how she's feeling. I can look at her face. I can hear her voice. I can see how she's walking, right? People that you know, you just know. Jesus knows you. If you're his disciple, if you know him, if you're in relationship with him, level two, he knows you. Jesus knew these guys. He'd been walking with them for three years. He knew, I don't, I mean, probably this was his divine knowledge, and probably he just looked at them, right? Because they're all going, oh, mm mm-hmm. And then Peter's like, what? (laughs) I just picture Peter as the most obvious of all of them. John was sneaking around in the back somewhere. Jesus has empathy for us. And so then he begins to explain himself. And he says, listen, here's what I mean. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the, and the world will rejoice. You'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Listen to this. This is extremely important. Your sorrow, he's saying to his disciples, will turn into joy. And then he tells this the story he says, listen, it's, it's kind of like this. You know, when a woman goes into labor, she's not like, yay, childbirth. I've watched my wife do this four times, and um, none among those times has she been like, yes, labor, woo, right? I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you knew people like that. That's the, clinically, that's called crazy. That's crazy, all right? Because, I mean, I've broken arms. I've had my finger severed. I've had a lot of pain happen to me. And what I observe is, oh, Jesus, you have built her stronger than me. That's my observation. And I'm just like, thank you, Lord, that I can help her. And, and oh, praise the Lord. Just, mm, hallelujah. All right, so that you don't walk into that moment and go, well, this is pleasant, right? Right? No, no, there's, no, there's no sandals vacations where this is an option, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is a non-pleasant experience. Yet, five minutes after it's over, sorrow turns to joy. That's the point. Jesus is saying, what you're about to walk through is going to hurt like hell. It's going to hurt. It's going to be really hard. But kind of like this birth thing, it's going to work like that. Because not only does Jesus come alongside, I mean, remember, our big idea is that Jesus knows our sorrows better than we think, but offers us victory also better than we've dreamed. He doesn't just arrange uncertainty for us and then have empathy for us. That moment has a destiny. Level one, this this moment that he's arranging of, of coming to the cross and dying but then rising, this was not unto no purpose. That moment was not unto no purpose. Do you know why I know, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard your life has been, no matter what anyone has done to you or what you've done to anyone, do you know how I know for a fact that God, if you come to him, if you trust him, if he owns your life, God will work pure joy out of pure evil? Do you know how I know that? Because nothing that has ever been done to you or by you was as bad as what was about to happen here. So level two, if you belong to Jesus and you're looking at your life and you're going, how in the world could God turn this sorrow to my joy? My answer is, I don't know exactly, but I know that he can because he's the God who turned the slow, torturous murder of his son into joy for billions and billions and billions forever and ever and ever. So of this, I am very confident that though I don't know your circumstance, boy, does God, and not just intellectually, he knows sorrow. He knows it. And he never arranges it for his people. He never allows it for his people. He never will bring you down a dark path that will not be overshadowed by the brightness of the coming dawn. 
I know it. And I know it because that's how he treated his son. He says, listen, you're going to have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Now this, this thing, I, I want to bring out another thought, that as Jesus leads us, and because we know Jesus knows our sorrows better than we think, but is offering us now a victory better than we've dreamed. Part of the way we know it's better than we've dreamed is by what he does with our sorrows. It's by what he does with our sorrows. So he's leading his disciples. We're back at level one now, back in the story, back in history. He's leading his disciples through this moment that's going to be really, really hard, but turn into something really, really good, which means... Not that moment will be for them a destiny moment, but it will also have adversity, right? It's going to have some adversity. It's going to be hard, and not just hard like internally, but there are going to be some people, some situations, some life stuff pushing against them. There are going to be people who want to arrest those disciples. There are going to be people who try and pin them to Jesus and want to hurt them along with Jesus. And so there, there's going to come some adversity. Okay, so level two, you got to know there'll come some adversity for you too. Your sorrow moments aren't just going to be sad moments. They're going to be moments where people, where your spiritual enemy, where this world and your own flesh are going to seek to push you back like a strong current. And that's what was going on here. And yet he says, I'm not going to set aside your pain. I'm going to transform it. In the beginning I told you that you know, we have this predilection for avoiding pain. We avoid death. You know, we, we do everything we can to look as though we're not dying. Right? We go to the gym. We've got all the things in America to keep us from death, sadness, pain, etc. Because we don't want to experience it. We want sorrow and anxiety and pain to be set aside so that we can have all of the good stuff out of life. And what we do, and we're great at this in the West, is reading that desire onto God. Jesus never promised you would not have pain. Neither did he promise that your victory would just be a lot better than your pain. Jesus, and this is part of the way we know Jesus knows, knows our sorrows better than we think he does and is promising us a victory better than we've dreamed because Jesus is the only one who promises to transform your pain into your joy. Here, he does not say, you're going to have sorrow, but don't worry, that will cease, and then you're going to have joy. No. No. He says, you're going to have sorrow, and I am going to transform it. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Don't glide over that. Like, this is an inspired text. The Holy Spirit wrote it this way for a reason. Logically, it makes more sense to say, well, you're going to hurt for 10 minutes, but then it's going to be awesome for 10,000 years. That's not it. He's actually saying to level one, disciples, your sorrow this moment is going to be what you sing about in a year. What do we sing about in this church? What do we sing about in any church? A cross. A, a cross. A torture instrument. One of the worst ones ever devised. When, when, what else are we singing about? The blood of Jesus. Most of us don't rejoice when we see blood. We rejoice at his. What are we, what are we coming to? E Easter, a, a resurrection. A resurrection's only good news because it was preceded by a death. Jesus transforms sorrow into joy, which is part of how we know that the victory he offers us is better than we have ever dreamed. So he says, in that day, you'll ask nothing of me. Truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name will be given to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. It's, you know, one of you should go back over the last, like, four chapters and just pick up every time Jesus makes this promise. Because he's made it, like, five or six times. Ask me. I'm going to say yes. Your joy will be full. God will get glory. Just ask me. Stay connected to me. Talk to me. Ask me for stuff. I'm going to give it to you. Your joy is going to be. This is a constant thing which tells us something else. Not only if we're going to make this journey with Jesus and if the disciples are making this journey with Jesus from sorrow to joy. Okay, we said it started with um, uncertainty and then the empathy of Jesus, which leads us through a moment that God has both a destiny for, but there's also going to be some adversity. There's another part of this which says that Jesus is going to be, uh, create with us a, a deep 
intimacy. I- intimacy. Now, that's one of those words that is incorrectly used in, in culture, so it, it, try, to, try to fill it with some new meaning here. I'm not talking about romance, Fifty Shades of... All right, that's... By the way, it, it, some of you have emailed me, asterisk to the sermon, my opinions on Fifty Shades of Grey. Are you ready? Here it is. Pornography is still wrong. That's all. Thank you. Um, there you go. Um, just because you turn it into a movie and it's written into really, really appalling fiction doesn't all of a sudden make it good. It's just, it's just well-decorated wrongness. So there you go. Now you know. All right, back to the text. I'll let you know if Jesus decides that pornography is okay. You'll be the first to know. Just wouldn't hold my breath. All right. Back into the text. He's saying intimacy, not in this disgusting way or this false way the world offers it to us. He's talking about closeness. Relational closeness. You know something that I don't understand, but I I believe it, but I don't fully understand it. Jesus, in the synoptics, talks about when, when the kingdom of God comes, there's no more marriage. Now, that bums me out a little bit. But I really like my wife. And I don't know if you're allowed to give anybody the evil eye, but if she's walking along some heavenly stream with another dude, I'm just going <laughs> to not be down with that. Um, hallelujah. All right. <laughs> I don't know how that works. I think, though, that's not so much what it means. What Jesus is talking about in that, in that text, I think, is the kind of joy and closeness that marriage is sort of a foreshadowing of is coming in such a way that we don't need the foreshadow anymore. You know, when you've arrived at your destination, you don't need the sign any longer. You don't. I think... That's what he means. I think he's talking about, listen, when, if you trust in me, in, in your deepest moments of sorrow, disciples, you're going to be close. And, and on the other side of this thing, uh, as, I, as I rise, you're going to be able to talk to the Father, he's saying. Th- that's an insane promise for a first century Jew, by the way. That was not a deal. I mean, we in sort of our own individualistic West, Western culture think like, oh yeah, me and God, we're cool. But just so you know, pump the brakes on that one for a little bit. For most of like the history of Abrahamic religions, not happening, all right? Not happening. There's God and there's you and then there's lots of ritual and well-dressed people in between. And you need to go through them, right? It smells and bells and blood and all kinds of stuff. And so what Jesus is promising is, you're not even going to need to talk to me. You're going to talk to God, and he's going to talk to you, and there's going to be a closeness here because it's going to be really hard. The sorrow's really going to come. It's going to be really challenging. But on the other side of it, you're going to be intimate with God in a way you don't even get right now. That counts for us. Okay, level two. So in, in our sorrows and in our moments, if you belong to Jesus, they're never designed to get you further out from God. Well, that would be the enemy's design for them. Well, that'll only happen if you get bitter. But if you trust him, God is very acquainted with sorrow. And will lead you into a victory that on the other side you're going to go, oh, you're here. And you trust him. It's like a friend that you've walked through some hard time with. You're just closer, aren't you? And then he comes into this, ask whatever you receive that your joy may be full. I've said these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech. Okay, so the hour is coming. There's going to be a time that Jesus is talking about after this moment of sorrow here in the text, level one. Once I go to the cross and rise, you're going to really get this. You're not going to need parables. You're not going to need analogies. You're not going to need birth metaphors and vine metaphors because you're going to understand I have overcome the world. I've overcome death so that by faith in me, you can overcome it too. That's level one. His disciples didn't know that, which probably created a huge amount of anxiety in their souls. Level two for us is simply the same applied to all of our anxious moments. The same applied to all of our dark dark moments and challenging providences. That day you will ask in my name, for the Father loves you because you have loved me and and have believed that I came from the Father. And what I think is really funny here is in verse 29, his disciples are like, oh, (laughs) you know what no one ever has reading this text? The, the reaction of, oh, <laughs> you don't read that text and go, oh, that was very clear. 
No, at all. And so his disciples are like, like <laughs> sometimes I'll tell my wife a joke and my children will laugh at it. And we're like, you're not laughing at the punchline. I don't know what you're laughing at because you're too young to get this. That's what's going on here. Like, oh, you think you get this? Adorable. No, you don't. Do you know what I'm saying? They're, they're going, oh, now you're speaking to us plainly and not using figure, figures of speech. And Jesus just said he was using figures of speech. But they're like, we get it. And he's like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Not at all. Which tells us that there's a little bit of irony in this moment. The irony comes when, when the disciples, we're back down here at level one in the story, the disciples tell Jesus like, oh, we get the whole redemption thing before it happened. <laughs> We get how this is going to work now. Oh, okay, you're saying it very clear, Jesus. As though all of a sudden, on that side of the cross and the resurrection, they had this fully formed theology of how the gospel was going to work. And Jesus thought that was funny. And his response is, oh, you get it, do you? Now you believe. Well, let me tell you what's about to happen. You're all going to abandon me. You're going to scatter. You're going to run away to your house. Yet I am not alone. Because the Father is with me. There's something kind of deadly that happens when you're walking through a moment of sorrow and you think you know exactly how God is working in the moment. The very subtle thing that happens is you start trusting in your reading of the situation more than in God's leading of the situation. And that's not good. Jesus was doing a thing no one, no one expected until he did it, right? No one expected, and then he did it, and everyone, oh my gosh, this is so much better than what we could have ever imagined. But in that moment, the disciples were like, oh, now we get it, now we get it, and they didn't get it, but they were kind of faking it, pretending like they got it, or maybe they really did think they had it, and they didn't. Level two, my friends, you belong to Jesus when you're walking through a hard moment. Be very, very careful about reading the tea leaves. Shouldn't do that anyway, that's paganism. Be very, very careful about assuming upon yourself divine knowledge of exactly how everything will work. Listen, God will give you insight. And like right now, like 10 years on the other side of some significant pain in my life, I can see some things like, oh, I see a little bit of what you were doing here. But very often, in, in your darkest moment, in a sorrowful providence, you can't see what God is doing. And that's by design. So don't. Don't pretend to. Don't try. It, counseling tip. If you ever want to, you know, be a friend. Please, when your Christian friend is suffering, do not come alongside them and pontificate about what God might be doing. That's probably one of the worst things you could ever do. I don't know, maybe God, right in this moment, maybe he's arranging the, dip, 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 but you don't know, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're literally speaking nonsense. And the more and more you speak nonsense, the worse and worse it gets, right? Hey, I wrote this book full of gibberish for you. This should help. No. You know what your friend needs? You. Because what you need in that moment is God. Relationally. By faith. Knowing, okay, you... You know sorrow better than I think. And you have a victory better than I've dreamed. And so Jesus, you'd think after that bit of bad news, Jesus is going to be like, yeah, y'all are all going to leave me. Jerks. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the way we might roll it. Like, you know, y'all are all going to peace out and leave me here. And, you know, they're going to beat me slowly. And you're going to run away from a little girl, Peter. Yeah, it's, watch this. And, and, you know, he doesn't do any of that. Yet I am not alone. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. So that when they were going through the moment and on the other side, they're having a series of aha moments. And there's peace in their soul. Oh, Jesus knew the whole time. He knew the whole time. He knew exactly that the, how this was going to work. He knew definitely that this was going to hurt. He knew in this moment, level one, he knew coming to the cross, he knew how I was going to feel. He knew all my anxieties. He knew all my fears. He knew it, and he is winning a victory over it so I can trust him in it because Jesus knows suffering better than you think, but he's bringing a victory better than you've dreamed because he shows up at the end of that and says this, listen, in this world, you will have 
tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. That's why we don't sit in our dark moment and just going, well, this all stinks for Jesus. No, we are people who are encouraged. We are people who have a little bit of joy. We are people who have faith. We are people who have got some expectation because Jesus' darkest moment, which is the darkest of all possible moments, was brought three days later by a dawning no one could have ever expected. So what I am sure of in your darkest moment is that on the other side of it, if you trust in Christ, you can take heart because he has overcome the world and by faith in him, you will too. You will That is why many of these paragraphs are preceded with statements like, therefore let your heart not be troubled. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm bringing you peace because it's going to be hard, absolutely. But when it's hard, I am there with you. I am arranging this for you. I am leading you. Don't try to read what I'm doing because you're a creature. I'm your maker. I'm smarter than you. But don't worry either because I am winning a victory for you. You need to know that. Because very often in the church, it's just kind of like, oh, well, if you just pray in Jesus' name, then, you know, you shouldn't be sad. Well, no, there are definitely hard moments in your life. But the way you journey through them should look like this. The way you walk through them starts with, okay, this is, there's some uncertainty here, and I don't know what's going on. But Jesus is here with unbelievable empathy because he knows what it is like to suffer. And even in this moment that I don't understand, if I trust in him, he's got a destiny for it. This horrible situation, he's got purpose in it, always. And we know that because he had purpose in the cross, which was worse than whatever you're experiencing. And through that pain, there was an intimacy that was developed with Jesus on the other side, which is leading to victory. So don't fear. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus knows your sorrow better than you think, and he offers you victory better than you've dreamed. So please come to Jesus with your sorrows. He is the only one who has walked through the worst sorrow to the greatest victory, and by faith in him, you will walk in great victory too. This morning, some of you are sad. Some of you are lonely. Some of you are broken. Some of you are mourning a loss. It was a recent loss. It was a not-so-recent loss. Come to Jesus with your sorrow and exchange your sorrow for joy. He is the only God who's experienced it, promises to transform it, and has already won victory over it. So come. Come to Jesus. With faith in Jesus, exchange your sorrow for joy. Will you please stand?